Okay. So now it should be working. It's always, there always needs to be something, no? <laughs> of course, always. Okay. Yes, yes. Okay. So now it should be fine. Um, excellent. Okay, good. So yeah. Hello, everyone who is now seeing us on Facebook. Um, we we'll sort of begin again. And uh, yeah, so welcome to Richard. Uh, we're unbelievably thrilled to have you uh, speaking as part of uh, Font Fashion Week. Uh, we love the new typeface. And uh, I will not say more. I leave it up to you. And the good news is you are the last speaker of the day. So uh, you can just chill and relax. And if you need to take more time, just you know, feel free. <laughs> okay, so I will go away now and I come back when it's time for the Q&A. Thank you so much and welcome, Richard. Thank you, Nadine. Um, and hi, everybody. It's, it's great to be here and thanks for joining me today. So for those of you who might be familiar with my type designs, it should be fairly obvious that I have an affinity for drawing script typefaces. Um, given my background as a calligrapher, it's probably no great mystery how this interest in letter forms led me first towards an opportunity to design type at Bitstream, uh, one of the first digital type foundries back in 83, which eventually pulled me into the world of script styles, which include Bickham and Sloop, two of my more well-known designs, and of course, Dunhill, my new family. Um, it's been an important and interesting process for me to think about the origins um, and historical development of scripts in order to gain some perspective on how they were initially intended to be used in the past and how that history might inform my approach to both the design and practical use of scripts today. Here we see a sample of Dunhill's feature set with some discretionary choices for the type user on the left half and several contextual substitutions shown that users can automatically access on the right half. And we'll see more of Dunhill in a little while, but first let's take a short historical journey. Before we go way back in the time machine for a brief visit to the 10th century, let's take a look where we've been in the last 170 years to now. I think we're all aware of the Spencer, Palmer, and Zanner methods of teaching cursive penmanship to school-aged children starting in the mid-1800s. These writing programs existed in order for kids to learn how to connect the letters to each other in an attempt to make their writing more uniform and legible. Personally, I don't believe these particular methods were aesthetically very pleasing intuitive, or more importantly, personally expressive. And early on during this period, in 1867, the invention of a typewriter, which in hindsight had its own mechanical letter-making charm, proved to become a nail in the coffin of visual personal expression. And that writing is a way that we can all make our own marks on paper. And as the typewriter caught on, and the relentless march toward mechanization, we have all become subject to the ensuing technologies that have followed. Oops, these slides are bouncing around. Sorry about that. Um, and that are in the mainstream today. And I feel that though we've gained an immeasurable, an immeasurable amount that is beneficial, we've lost a vibrant means of personal expression. As our schools and society have mostly abandon the activity of learning to write in cursive with a pen. But despite this discouraging loss, I, I believe the appeal for me in continuing to write with a pen and in drawing script typefaces lies in the fact that there is inherent in this style, a strong connection to the past through handwritten and engraved scripts, which evoke a certain degree of expressive drama. This is my typeface, Avalon. Um, it, it's more personal, at least to me, than the current trends used in branding and typography. I also feel that more formal scripts, which can be defined as being less like handwriting and 
more mechanical appearance are better served when they're reserved for special circumstances. And when used in a typographically appropriate context, a formal script can contribute to making the design of a page extraordinarily effective. Here we see Bickham used for Victoria Magazine. As you may be familiar with, the origins of early Latin typefaces were based on the manuscript pen forms that preceded them and the broad edged tools that formed them. In the late 15th and early 16th century, these humanist type designs have provided the models that contemporary type designers consistently abide by today. As Matthew Carter has said, the alphabet is a code and what makes type readable does not actually change. That's why we can read stuff that was printed 200 years ago. He's essentially saying that an A is an A is an A, and that if the letter's structure breaks down to the point that it cannot be identified as an A, then the purpose, oh, excuse me, the slide, these are just bouncing around, I apologize. And the purpose of the alphabet to communicate has been compromised, challenged, or potentially even lost. This can of course be intentional and serve the overall design and can really push at the boundaries of legibility. This issue of legibility in script designs is important to consider historically, but let's step back again to pens and ink. Calligraphically speaking, it's the potential nature of a particular writing tool's movement across the page that connects the letters to each other with either physical joins or merely energetically, so that the lettering can become a gestural art, incorporating more variation in form. I'm consistently drawn towards this approach to making letters as it produces a very different set of aesthetic considerations compared to those letters which operate in the world of mechanical type, where every character is identical and harmony comes from a sense of uniformity and repetitive pattern. It's important to remember though that formal script typefaces basically treat letter forms the same mechanical way, where for the most part, every character is identical, though the difference I believe lies in the slanted dynamics of italics and scripts, where the origin of the writing tool used to form these letters is apparent in their energy and in their movement, giving them a warmth and a rhythmic flow, recalling the presence of the human hand and the inked pen that we see here. The history of written forms encompasses a timeline where Gothic calligraphic manuscript styles gradually morphed into a more fluid minuscule called Carolingian in the 9th and 10th centuries in Europe. But in the ensuing 400 years, these manuscript letter forms gradually migrated back to a more compressed and darker, darker Gothic styles, in part as a result of the changing political and regional power landscape, and to those who had the power to make cultural decisions, even about the prevailing styles of letter forms. The Italian humanists of the 15th century, revolting against what had become the heavy Gothicized look of previous manuscript book hands, wanted to revert back to a gentler, more Carolingian script. This was the beginning of a trend in letter shape in the 16th century that ultimately led to the development of italic forms. Here, we see Arrighi's woodcut italic at the top and Nicoli's fluid italic handwriting at the bottom. And here, here is Robert Grandjean's lovely 17th century italic type. This slanted letter form movement eventually led to the rise of various regional script forms, which developed over the next 200 years. Script writing styles 
came into their own during the accelerated growth of commerce in Europe in the 17th century as a means of getting information down on paper quickly and efficiently. More often than not, serving rather humdrum purposes like recording contracts, bills of sale, inventories, and tax forms. A somewhat higher purpose for the use of handwritten scripts came into government service as the need for charters and uh, proclamations and international correspondence became apparent. This need for a practiced writing hand was further enhanced by the general spread of knowledge in Europe and elsewhere due to the dissemination of affordable printed books to the more successful and ambitious middle classes. In his introduction to the 1941 facsimile edition of the Universal Penman, Philip Hofer says, from 1680 to 1740, hardly a year passed without an important copybook appearing and all of this activity and interest was caused by just two things, the rising importance of English commercial enterprise and the development under these writing masters of a round, even flowing hand for business correspondence, which proved to be a perfect technique when used by well-trained clerks. It was legible, neat in appearance, and above all, swifter in execution than any of the hands practiced at that time elsewhere in Europe. The universal penman contained the work of several writing masters whose combined round hand styles became the inspiration for my typeface Bigham script, which was a, primarily a display typeface meant to add calligraphic elegance to a typographic composition in headings or short passages of large text. It derives, however, from what was originally considered a practical everyday writing style. So again, there was a need for a style of writing taught by the writing masters of the day and promoted in their copy books to accommodate the rise of the business class in Europe. And these various styles of writing could achieve either a practiced and practical written appearance or through the refined process of copper engraving where multiple editions of a piece of writing could be printed, this technique could attain a more formal and refined elegance, which inevitably led, whoops, which inevitably led to the proliferation of lavishly ornamented styles. There really was no tasteful boundaries regarding these displays of penmanship with one writing master trying to outdo the others in the hope of attracting more clients and students. The apparent positive result of all this competition was that elegant handwriting emerged as a status symbol. And by the 1700s, penmanship schools had begun educating generations of master scribes. In its more sedate forms, the predominant English round hand style was considered easy to read and significantly for its widespread success, easy to teach. The craft of legible and graceful handwriting was a useful business skill. But I believe that scripts are not always intended to be used in contexts where strict legibility is necessarily the priority. Scripts are generally display designs and can certainly push at the boundaries of readability, especially if overused and at too small a point size. As an example, my typeface Savannah is a very condensed design and needs just the right context for it to be effective. It is of course always the typographer's choice to decide what typeface designs are appropriate to any given piece of communication and how well they are set for that use. Though this page has a lovely texture, especially in German, you might not want to necessarily read a script typeface used en masse in more lines than say an invitation might provide. Type designers in their process usually have a go-to visual system for being able to judge, at least initially, where a new design is headed. 
For my script designs, I think it's important to pair them early on with Romans, sans or serif, to get a sense of what's working and what may not be. Here, I've set my eight script designs in a single line, paired with two of my Roman display faces, Bennett and Mino, in a way that I find visually informative. This method helps me to quickly see their aesthetic rhythm, texture, and practical usability, which helps me to decide what changes might be needed at an early stage of the drawing process. Obviously, some styles certainly work better than others in this particular context. And you might think that combining my scripts with a headline for a Tiffany's in Paris may tell you something about my branding aspirations for these designs. But I can assure you that my ambitions are flexible, seeing Dunhill used here. Like my other script designs, Dunhill was born from the same desire to achieve some interesting visual movement when setting even a single line of text. The idea for this new script began not from any specific historical sources, but from an observation and then a small detail generated by my freehand letter sketching. So first, the observation. I teach type design at the Rhode Island School of Design, and I start my students off with a calligraphy workshop. Inevitably, there is a left-handed student in class, and it's always interesting to me to see how they work out a way to hold the broad-edged pen in order to draw the correct pen angles based on the models I provide. But I've noticed that as they start to letter without any initial guidance from me that the pen angles come out the reverse, the sketches on the right, of what a right-handed student will make, the N on the left. So from this small seed of an idea for Dunhill, the particular shape of these vertical strokes, and this interesting repeating triangular notch that also appears as a result of this reverse pen angle, I developed a, a formal semi-connecting script, which evolved into this five-weight family. My general working process in developing an initial single weight for a script design is to start with any lettering tool at hand to render my rough ideas onto paper. I might end up using a pointed flexible pen or pencil or a small nibbed broad edged fountain pen. I'm actually not too handy with a flexible pointed nib, which was the tool used to make the lovely English round hand script. It takes a lot of discipline to become proficient with this type of pen. And I really admire those practitioners who can make beautiful letters and can flourish with this very pliant tool. Um, Dunhill incorporates several details that show the pen at work, both in the terminal shapes and in the caps and ascenders. Dunhill also has a variety of alternate stylistic glyphs and contextual features that help it achieve more glyph-to-glyph -glyph physical joins that allow it to become more of a connected script some of which are shown here. And with the creative capability of open type features and the power of variable font technology, showing Dunhill's weight axis here, the best of what type designers can imagine and draw have now become an integral part of our designs for our users to take full advantage of. Thank you so much for joining me. This is this is brilliant. Thank you so much. I every time I see a piece of calligraphy, I feel so untalented. <laughs> For me, it's a mystery, you know, because I I could never do that. And and to bring that the energy and movement has always been my like my, my dream. Basically, it's the Everest I want to climb, you know, because when you don't come with that type of drawing background, it's very difficult to fake it. You know, this is very very hard to draw. Like. Sometimes 
for maybe for people who had don't draw type they will look at it and it feels natural because there is you know you're just following calligraphic models but to be able to draw something that looks convincingly as if it had been drawn by hand but then to do it so expertly and so well that it actually replicates in typographic form and to bring that energy and that movement is just really well done thank you so much this has been brilliant really really brilliant and i really love the typeface and and i I didn't know why until you mentioned the the river the, the left-handed thing that made and i was looking at it and i was like why is it so different because it looks right but it's different and i couldn't tell until you mentioned it so i learned something today thank you um uh, yeah one. really really beautiful work thank you so much um so if anyone has questions please put them in the q a and if not uh in the meantime i will then ah no we have questions excellent so from Jean Francois um I have seen you playing with the Wacom tablet back in 1996 to catch the right flow for your scripts could you show or explain what is your process um I, I've never really um, engaged with the uh, Wacom tablet um, I might have been playing with it at a conference but for me that was probably the first time um, I was pretty impressed with some of the capabilities of the tool but um, generally, I stick to analog um, pen on paper ideas to get my particular typefaces started. You know, once again, reiterating that my background is as a calligrapher, so my approach to type design tends to be from that direction. Um, my process is different for every typeface. Um, I mean, it generally stays the same for script designs, but I've also designed I have a pretty eclectic library. Um, and if you look at um, all of my current typefaces, I, I may not even remember how I started some of them, but <laughs> um, the more um, practical approach is to, as I said in the talk, kind of grab any writing tool um, and just start playing around with letter forms. So a calligrapher is always doodling um, with broad edge tools or a brush or a pointed pen. And you know, if you look at a sketchbook um, of any person who's been in the business for a while, you, you might see 50 to 100 different possible ideas or small seeds of an idea that might be developed into a typeface. And of course, many ideas that may not go anywhere. But I think the challenge for anybody in this field is to decide what's worth pursuing because it's a very time challenging process to design type and you don't want to go off in lots of different tangential directions you want to stay focused that's a big challenge in type is to really find what's worth pursuing um, to its end and then and still then you, you need to decide if it's worth um, finishing because a single weight of a typeface could just be the beginning of a, a family design yeah. Um, one nice thing about script typefaces, I must say, is they tend not to be huge families. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Whereas a text typeface uh, that may have a display version um, <clears throat> and weights from and weight widths from thin compressed to black ultra wide take a lot of time to draw and, and work mm -hmm. out. So the process is different for the design, for the specific design. Yeah. Nice. Perfect. Yeah, because Jean-Francois was like, he had a follow-up question, like, how do you deal between like, or transition between the ideas, the sketches on paper and the busier curves? So do you, for example, do you scan and then redraw from those? Like, how does that transition work? Yeah, I think for me, my process is to generally get as much down on paper as possible, and then I'll scan those images and digitize from them. Um, okay. For a, a Roman text face, I, I tend not to draw as much as I might for a script face yeah. because there's a certain modularity to Roman designs that once mm -hmm. you establish a certain set of control characters, you can yeah. basically start to steal elements yeah, from what correct. you've already <laughs> digitized yeah. to use for other letters. You know, letters come in groups and there's similarities in yeah. certain segments of the alphabet, especially in sans serif designs a little less so in serif designs so once again the key is trying to get a fair bit of work done and everybody works differently everyone's process is a little different but the idea is you know this is a long-term project so try to save some time and steal what you can digitally 
from yes. good models. Um, that's pretty much how I work. Right. Excellent. Thank you. Most of the questions are, are about process because I think when when we look at type cases like you know Dunhill script or other type cases that you've done, it's it's the 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 craftsmanship that goes into them that leaves one wondering like how how <laughs> how do you manage that? So so there's you know. Uh, a few questions around those. So, uh, for example, Dominic is saying fabulous work. Um, whereas a constructed type designer might start with some key characters like N O H caps. Uh, what was the process for this calligraphy? Uh, like, do you start from a specific character? Like, where would you start? Yeah. Um, so I've been doing this a long time, <clears throat> about forty years, and I, I have a working process that is familiar to me and comfortable. So yes, I do start with control characters, whether it's a script or a Roman, mm -hmm. sans or serif, I always start with lowercase n, o, and p. Um, yeah. I find that it's really important to grab those characters because the n, whether Roman or, or a script or italic has got two vertical strokes, mm -hmm. the o are two rounds and the p is a combination of both. So, I feel that if you can work out the essential elements in those three key characters, um, there'll be a certain clarity in where to go to the next grouping. And once those next set of glyphs is done, then there's a certain clarity in moving on to the next set. I tend to work lowercase out first, and then I move toward the caps. Um, because essentially caps are used at the head of sentences with lowercase, and rarely are they set all together, no matter what style of typeface you're designing. Mm -hmm. Although my accountant always sends me his email messages to me, all caps. <laughs> so I, I always feel he's shouting at me and that I'm in trouble. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Even if he says, great news, I feel like, oh no, what have I done wrong? <laughs> um, so I tend to focus on the lowercase, and um, I won't tend to move toward the caps until I'm pretty happy with the lowercase. Yeah. But of course, caps are based on certain elements of the lowercase. So a typeface kind of grows naturally hmm. um, in, in a direction. And yeah. once again, I, you know, I can only emphasize that different type designers, probably their process is probably different than mine. but. Um, when I teach, I kind of teach my process because I think it's pretty efficient. Yeah. And I think it helps students have um, a certain focus um, that you need to get something done. So yeah, but, I hope that answers the question. Yes, yes. But can I, I will add my follow-up just for curiosity. At what point does the A come in and at what point do you put the S in? Okay, I say the S till last with... <laughs> With the, with the K and the Z, um, <laughs> you know, there are a handful of characters that just don't follow the rules. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, and it's always remarkable. I'm, I'm teaching a type design class at the moment, and everyone's up to that stage in the lowercase where they're saying, how do I draw the S? What, what should the K look like and the Z? Yeah. And those are challenging characters in, in a lowercase set. Um, once again, I'll sketch them out. I always encourage my students to go back to pen or pencil and paper uh, and try to work it out that way. Because, you know, once you're on screen, um, unless you're really proficient at um, manipulating little vector nodes around, it's very hard to draw accurately when you don't have a template. So I encourage students to always draw on paper and then use that sketch as a template to digitize from. Um, there's no easy way to do those letters because um, no. the challenge is to see what you've done previous to say the controls and another set of lowercase and base the designs of the S, the K and the Z and the lowercase two-story A mm -hmm. on what you've already established as far as shapes and details and try to draw based on those elements. Not easy, but <laughs> most, most everybody works it out eventually. Yeah. yeah, no, but I think this is a comfort for other designers to hear because it quite often comes up, even from highly experienced type designers, that the like the S is the bane of their existence or the eight or the lowercase g, you know, because like the tilting forward and backwards, it's even come up this week as well. So it's really nice to see that someone with your proficiency and your background still leaves the S to the end. 
<laughs> so, uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, that's, that's good to know. Um, if we, well, we're way over time, but if we do have time, I, I will ask you about maybe advice on how to draw a good ass, um, which just, you know, to support other designers. Uh, we have a question from Sabrina Lopez, who is also one of the founders on ILT, so I'm really happy, and, and from Argentina. So good morning, Sabrina. So she's asking, uh, what's your opinion about the uh, future of digital script fonts in this moment of explosion of mobile apps? What place do you think they will have in the near future? And and uh, last year, someone asked me uh, if the future generations would be able to read connected script forms. If they'll be able to what? Sorry? To read connected script forms. Good questions. Um, you know, I wish I, <laughs> I wish I could see the future. Uh, um, you know, I, I would suggest that script forms on, on, on mobile phones may be a difficult thing to um, work successfully just because of the the rough resolutions. I mean, as you know, technology has just skyrocketing as far as screen resolution. And you know, mm -hmm. from from the amount of time that I've been um, working on the personal computer, basically at the start of Apple, I'm amazed at how what good a Retina screen looks like. And even in phones now, current phones display type beautifully. Um, just because of um, the need for um, and the competition within the industry to make things work really well visually. So type designers are always engaged in um, making their work look the best it can given current technologies. And there are designers um, who even surpass what is currently necessary, thinking about the next stage of technology and how that will render type on whatever screens we use. Um, it's very impressive to see what a, um, a foundry like underwear is doing um, in the industry as far as thinking ahead. And, and David Burlow at Font Bureau just have a certain vision of what where technology will be and making types now that will fit into future technologies. Specifically, as far as script faces, I, I don't know what the world will hold for them in the future. Um, I certainly won't stop designing them as long as I can hold a mouse um, <laughs> and work a trackpad. They just engage me in, in so many different ways, some of which I tried to uh, explain in the talk. Um, I, I hope they will survive. I hope connecting scripts will be used respectfully because, I mean, I've seen, <laughs> I think every type designer has seen their types and other designers types kind of destroyed by some users who just you yes. know unexperienced <laughs> uneducated typographers who might track a connecting script wide so that the joints don't join yeah. um, there's always all these type crimes and in a way they're amusing to see but they're also discouraging because you spend a lot of time trying to work out minute details of your design and then you all you can do is put them out in the world and hope for the best and sometimes the best is never quite good enough but sometimes i see my designs used beautifully like in the victoria magazine uh, magazine spread and it's just it's in a way breathtaking to see graphic designers use your work really well um, for me that's just it's so encouraging and um, it's it's a nice it's just, it's the prize really. Um, as type designers, we don't tend to make the products from our designs. Um, we, we need graphic designers and typographers to use our type really well. And it's just a wonderful thing to see that happen. So I encourage all graphic designers, typographers out there to um, let the type designers know how you're using their type. Well, I never get to see enough how my types are being used. I might come upon them by accident. I'll go to a liquor store. There's a beautiful wine label. <laughs> a bookstore, and I see a book jacket that's using my type, and I'm, I'm taking pictures of things. But I never get that feedback, enough of that feedback from actual yeah. users of the type. So I always encourage the users of my type or any type designer's type to let them know how how much you've enjoyed using their type and what, what you're making with them. Yeah, that, that is definitely excellent advice and, and recommendation as well. We definitely, we would like to hear the feedback 
even even if it's not a good one, I will definitely want to know if something I drew is not working. Um, Absolutely, yeah. But I, I have a I have a question about the using of the type. Um, at what what do you feel is the most comfortable letting space for a typeface like Dunham script? Out of the box, you know, twenty percent extra, so one twenty percent, or do you feel it can go? less or more like wh when you're designing it like where do you feel this is how would have done it on paper if i was writing an actual paragraph where where would be that comfort zone for you right so dunhill specifically i can certainly speak to um, i would say in general that different scripts may need different letting depending on the length of ascenders and the height of yeah and how they're drawn on the body but like particularly for dunhill script because this well, presentation dunhill doesn't that have one. particularly ornate ascender or descender features so you know I, I i might not necessarily be able to give you a letting number but just make sure that descenders don't crash into ascenders yeah uh, scripts in general need very generous letting um the mm -hmm. letters need to what i like to say they need to breathe yes um, and if, if they're set too tight, um, the page will look too dense. Um, and too squiggly as well, no? Too squiggly, yeah. yeah. So Savannah, that script I show, which is very compressed, will need a different um, set of different letting spec than Dunhill. So it's really specific to the typeface and the design and the color of it. So yeah, I would always say give a script pretty generous letting. Yeah. And in terms of width? Like how many words would you put on a yeah, line? Yeah, so um, once again, you don't want columns too narrow like a newspaper or too wide like um, a, mag a law book. So mm -hmm. maybe somewhere in between. Um, I don't know. I could suggest a column. Like five words, six words. Yeah, maybe I mean, 10, I think something 10 or 15 yeah. at the most. Yeah, okay. could be the most effective okay. way. Now, I see generally scripts are used for invitations and menus, um, yeah. magazine headings, and you know, sparsely, yeah. but effectively is the best yeah. way to use scripts, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But this one in particular, it feels really well uh, suited for logo design as well, particularly because of the heavyweights. Like I noticed when, when playing around with it that, because you do sometimes get really nice script typefaces, but the bold is never really, bold you know it's it it stays in that realm of text faces uh but then with this one with the heavier weights that you go it suddenly it feels like it's exploding on a page and it's really well suited for display as well so you can take it in the lower weights to small sizes but then in the heavier weights and let it rip you know it's like really quite loud so um yeah it might be quite nice to see it you know on a poster design or a massive billboard or something like that it would be really really nice Yes, it, it is a challenge to draw very black weights of script designs. Um, I love to do it, and I have tried to do it in most of my script families. Um, Bickham has a bold, not necessarily a black, um, but uh, Savannah also has a bold, not a black. Delaney has a black, Dunhill has a black, and I, I agree with you, Nadine, that they're very effective at large size. And there's more, the, since there's more contrast, the hairline stay the same way but the stem weights get really heavy. So that extra contrast really makes it pop off the page. Yeah, it's like a screaming at you, but in a nice way. <laughs> exactly, in a nice way, yeah. yeah. Yes, yeah. <laughs> yeah, good, good. Um, I, I won't take more of your time because we've gone way over time. Um, so there's a quick question from Glenn. What are some of your favorite resources for a beginning calligrapher? And then uh, the other question, those are the only two questions left uh, from Robert. Are you doing everything from start to end by yourself or do you get uh, technical support uh, in production? Um, okay, the first question. I With the resources, yeah. One really good book for beginning calligraphers. And it's a book by Sheila Waters, mm -hmm. um, who unfortunately just passed away not too long ago. Mm -hmm. But she's got a book called Foundations of Calligraphy, which I use in my class for my students. It's a wonderful guide um, to getting you started. Um, there are many good books, but if you're going to start with one, I would suggest Sheila's Foundations of Calligraphy. Um, as far as my process, um, so I work for a small type company. Um, I've been bouncing around a bit from Font Bureau to Type Network and now to the Type Founders. 
always have access to technical help, um, whether it's within the company or even outside. I've got colleagues who can always answer technical questions for me. I'm not a super tech guy. I run into issues with um, open type features and contextual rules um, that I always have resources to help me with that end of the, of the design process. And it's really important to have, but if you're just starting out in type, um, it's not necessarily necessary to, to get into all the weeds of the technical stuff, just draw, enjoy the drawing and the process. Um, there's still room for making basic um, type designs that don't necessarily need lots of rules and, and variable and open type um, structures. So I would suggest um, wait on that if you're just starting out and don't, don't get enmeshed in the tech too heavy quite yet. It'll just get in the way of maybe enjoying the process of drawing. Yeah, and sometimes, at least when it was with me, I was rushing so quickly to learn about how to program for Arabic and all of that, that uh, the ability to do one sort of took away time that I needed to invest in learning how to draw. Because you need the thousands of hours and you cannot hide bad outlines in nice technology. You know, like the outlines, the design itself, nothing can hide bad design. So it's so important to, in the beginning, strengthen your design skills, learn how to draw, draw effectively, and then, then you can get into more elaborate features, right? That, that can come exactly. later down the line. Everybody listen to Nadine, yes. <laughs> no, <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Um, no, but excellent. This, this has been fascinating. We, um, we, we went way over time. <laughs> so um, thank you so much. But this has been such a nice conversation. And um, this is the last call, uh, last talk for, for today, the day four out of from Fashion Week. But it does leave me with this lasting impression that it would be really nice to have more of these conversations and even as panel conversations to talk a little bit more about type, how we use it in some cases, but also how we make it in other cases as well. And then bring, I know there's quite a lot of, conferences in our world but sometimes we we just need to yeah sometimes sit down and, and have like comfortable chats and talk more so this has been really really fascinating thank you so much congratulations you. on the new beautiful beautiful typeface and um yeah thank you and uh thank you for everyone who has joined us today and has been patiently you know with us the whole uh time thank you so much thank you thank bye you lady bye bye